thank you all, and uh, thank you, Manish, and everybody else for inviting me here. I've never been to this place, though it's in Bangalore, but it's, but it's great to come here and uh, be with all of you. So what I'm going to do is in the next uh, 30 minutes or so, talk about India's digital transformation and basically try to connect all the dots because everybody knows lots is happening, but how do you connect the dots and how do you make sense of it? So that's what I plan to do. And that's the scope of this presentation. Now, one thing we know is that for those who are old enough to remember, in 1991, we had a balance of payments crisis, gold had to be sent to London and all that stuff. And today we have a very healthy surplus over $500 billion of reserves, even in, though in a very difficult environment where global interest rates are going up, FIIs are withdrawing money, all that. In spite of that, India has a very strong balance sheet on the forex front. And that's something that we've achieved in the last several years. But we've also gone from being among the world's most unbanked countries to the most banked countries. And essentially, several hundred million people have had bank accounts open under the Jandan program. And essentially, what would normally have taken 46 years or 47 years has happened in nine years. In other words, something happened to accelerate the pace of financial inclusion in India in the last decade so that we could leapfrog in terms of bank accounts and other financial things. And then we saw what happened on, on, on mobile phones in 2016-17. In uh, we had, you know, we had a new entrant into the market with Geo, and you could see that there's a dramatic drop in pricing of data consumption because Geo came out with two important insights. One is that voice is, demand is inelastic, which means that even if I make voice free, nobody's going to speak for six hours. But if I make data affordable, then people are going to watch YouTube all the time or TikTok. So on this realization, so India's data consumptions in 2016-17 uh, went from half a gig a month to half a gig a day. So there's a 30x increase in uh, data consumption in one year. And that also led to a massive growth in smartphones. So both these things happened together, the rise of smartphones and, of course, the lowering cost of data. And even today, the cost of data in India is among the cheapest in the world. And then we had the same time, around the same time we had the launch of UPI. UPI was a payment system designed by NPCI, where I'm an advisor. This idea was conceived in 2013. It was launched in May of 2016. In October 2016, UPI did 100,000 transactions. November 8, 2016, we had an important event called demonetization. And then digital payments became the most important thing. And then the Beam application was launched. And then we had many new entrants into payments like Phone Pay and Paytm and uh, Google Pay. And today, this platform does 7.3 billion transactions a month, which is the volume of transactions in both October and November. And it's the world's largest digital payment system designed to be interoperable and is very popular. About 260 million Indians use this payment platform, and it's very, very ubiquitous. And then, of course, we saw that with a slow start, India delivered on 2.15 billion vaccines in just two years. And this, again, was not only the fact that we had great vaccine manufacturing companies like Serum Institute and Bharat Biotech, but also because of the tech infrastructure behind that with the COVID application that the ministry launched which kept track of all the vaccinations. You could get your first dose in one city, your second dose in another city, your, your booster dose in a third city, and everybody got a digital vaccination certificate, which they could store on their phone or store on the cloud, and that became very easy to manage this whole process of vaccinating a billion people. And then on the education side, the Diksha platform, which was launched by the government, really took off during the pandemic. And today we have you know, 59 million learning minutes have been used across, across the country. And every Indian textbook which is printed by a state government is now QR coded. You may not be aware of this, but every textbook has about 20 QR codes per textbook. 
attached to different topics. And there are 600 million textbooks. That means there are 12 billion digitally addressable QR codes today in Indian textbooks. And therefore, you can have content which you can then link and point to any uh, material that you want. And the government has now launched a platform called NDR, which is essentially opening it up so that you can have market innovation on top of uh, the infrastructure which is there in terms of these QR codes and all that. So again, education is again another area where there has been dramatic change. So what, what does all this tell us? That in many different ways, India is making irreversible nonlinear change. When we say nonlinear change, nothing happens for years, and then suddenly something happens and it just takes over. And we keep seeing that in area and area. And therefore, when we sit here and we talk about the future and our strategies and our plans and our ambitions, it's important to know what are the kind of nonlinear changes that have happened, what is the impact they have had, and what are the nonlinear changes that are likely to happen, and what are the impact they could possibly have. And each of these changes contributes to the next change. And we have a phenomenon which we call as combinatorial innovation, where all these changes now starting interacting with each other, creating new market opportunities and new threats, because they're going to have threats, because they're going to commoditize some layer of the stack, or they're going to make it so easy for everyone to participate. And therefore, you have to think of this both as opportunities and of threats. And all this has been enabled by a series of technology building blocks. And we call these technology building blocks as digital public goods. In other words, these are essentially enabled or provided by the government and enabled so that everybody can use it. They're universal in nature, they're low cost, they're open architecture and so on. And when you think about it, the original internet and the original GPS were the first example of digital public goods because these are actually platforms built by government, in, in that case, the US government. And only 20 years after they were built, they were opened up for private innovation. So we you think of this as nothing but extending that same philosophy that the government or government partners should enable some fundamental digital rails or public goods on which you can innovate. And that's the whole philosophy. Now, what is this doing? Fundamentally, you are going through a massive upgrade. Think of it as a massive upgrade, like when you upgrade from DOS to Windows or something like that. And India is going from an offline, cash, informal, low productivity economy to an online, cashless, formal, high productivity economy. Now, this is not going to happen in one year or two years. It may take 10 years or 15 years. But the fundamental building blocks are in place. The fundamental momentum is in place. And we need to think about how to leverage and take advantage of this massive transition, which is one of a kind and happens only once in the history of a country. And the important thing is that the model, which is based on digital public goods, is inclusive. It's not about only you know, the avocado economy, the five million guys who can afford avocados. It's for one billion people. It's democratic, open access and creating the fundamental rails for a billion people to improve their lives. Now, the way, way we think about this is digital infrastructure in India is different from digital infrastructure in the Western markets. And the reason for this is very simple. How do you make money from infrastructure, digital infrastructure? In the Western world, you made money from advertising. This shows the, you know, it's almost, what, $800, $800 per person is the per capita revenue that uh, uh, the advertising industry makes from digital advertising. And in India, it's, it's, it's nothing. And therefore, we have a situation where you cannot make money in India from advertising. In the, in the digital world, the total revenue of Indian digital advertising may be $3, 4000000000 billion. It's mostly with Google and Facebook and a little bit with whichever, whoever has the IPL franchise. So that's the way it works there. But in the West, gigantic firms have been created purely on digital advertising. So Google and Facebook together have about $300 billion in revenue. 
And therefore, the whole model was that because the original internet did not have a method of making payments. It was, there was no way to make payments because there's no payment system on the internet. And therefore, the way to make money was to have advertising. The way to get advertising money was to get your attention. And therefore, you have this so-called attention economy where technology is being used to keep you gripped so that you spend more time watching a video or looking at some infuriating email or you know, some WhatsApp forwards. But that's unfortunately the way the internet has developed. In India, we cannot build an internet on advertising. So India's internet is actually built on digital transactions. And therefore having, that's why the UPI becomes so strategic because you need a very high volume, low cost payment system to actually enable, uh, actually enable uh, the uh, transactions at scale in the, Indian, in the Indian world. So we need a different payment system, microtransactions, and that's what we have. Now, these digital public goods that I talked about have not been built in a day. They have been built layer by layer over the last 15 years. And each layer, the idea is that you cannot build everything at one time, so you build each layer, and then that layer becomes used, and then you build layers. But all these layers have been thought through to be interoperable in nature. So they all plug each other and overall create that combinatorial innovation. And the layers include the ID layer, the payments layer, and the data layer. And I'll talk a little more about that. Now, the ID layer was the Aadha project, which I did. I joined the government in July of 2009. And I was given a one sheet of paper with my mandate to give every Indian a unique ID. It did, there was no digital word in that, my mandate, but we said, what the hell, if you're going to do an ID system in the 21st century, we should do it digitally. And therefore, we created a digital ID system, which has now about 1.3 billion people on it, and very heavily used. The daily authentications on Aadhaar today is 80 million a day. In other words, 80 million times people are using Aadhaar to verify themselves either with the OTP, an iris authentication, a face authentication, or a photograph of, uh, you know, or a, or a fingerprint authentication. And so it's ubiquitous. But not only does it do authentication, it also does something called KYC, or know your customer. And you can essentially, over the years, Aadhaar was made acceptable as a way to open a bank account, get a mobile connection, buy an insurance policy, buy a mutual fund, uh, buy a pension. And so we have a KYC, which enabled everyone to get those services very quickly. And the great example of the use of KYC was actually Reliance Geo, because Reliance Geo essentially wanted to give 100 million people a free mobile connection in six months. But every mobile connection required you to do a KYC. And if they had done it the old-fashioned way of paper-based KYC, it would have not happened but they happened to use the Aadhaar eKYC, so they could do an authentication and KYC within two minutes, and they could build a platform to give one million SIM cards a day. And hence, they were able to do 100 million SIM cards in six months. So Aadhaar KYC played a very crucial role in the massive expansion of, uh, of uh, uh, Geo, and other people are using it. All the banks, the payment banks, all the new banks, all of them use Aadhaar KYC. Zeroda built a huge, the largest discount brokerage company in the country, all using Aadhaar KYC. So fundamentally, it not only reduced time and improved productivity, it also reduced the barrier for newcomers to take on incumbents. And that's important about all these technologies, that they also reduce barriers for newcomers. And therefore, we have to think through the architecture of the firms we want to build so that we understand the new competitive threats that are coming. And then, of course, I talked about UPI, 7.3 uh, billion transactions. And this is something which everybody uses. Uh, and you know, it's ubiquitous. And it's not just, see, in, in the world of cards, the card population was only the top 20, 30 million people in the country. In the world of UPI, we have 260 million people using UPI already. And now, a number of things are happening in the UPI world. For example, UPI 1, 2, 3 is going to enable UPI on feature phones, 
which are going to be voice enabled in your own language. So you can give a payment instruction in Hindi or Tamil on your feature phone. And that will dramatically expand the use of payments by, by people. UPI Lite, which just got launched, allows you to you have an offline UPI. So for small value transactions up to a few hundred rupees, you don't have to hit the banking server. You can do a local transaction. That will take a lot of the load off the main payment system by offloading small value transactions. And there are many, many other innovations happening in the UPI world. So the UPI world, NPCI has made a public statement that their goal is to go from 7.3 billion transactions a month to 1 billion a day. So the goal, the stated public goal is 30 billion UPI transactions a month. And they're also taking it global. So today you can do UPI acceptance in Dubai. You can go and go to a Lulu shop in Dubai and you can pay using UPI. You're going to have cross-border remittances now with UPI. India and Singapore are shortly going to launch a real-time payment uh, cross-border system where an Indian migrant working on an oil, oil rig in Singapore can send money in real time at a much lower transaction fee to his bank account in India, and his spouse or his family can access that anywhere in the country using the network we have. So dramatic stuff is happening there. And a good example of the impl impact of this is the difference in acceptance points. Merchant acceptance is where a merchant takes a particular payment system. Now, before UPI came along, the only way to do merchant acceptance was through a POS machine. And it took India 60 years to get to about 5, 6 million POS machines. Because each POS machine, there's a hardware investment, you know, there's a, the bank has to check it out, etc. Essentially, UPI unbundled the QR, came up with the QR code way of making payments. So a merchant does not have to buy any hardware. He just has to stick a QR code, and you can start receiving payments. And the UPI, pay, UPI uh, QR code infrastructure is interoperable, which means anybody can put a QR code, and any consumer app can pay at that QR code. So if a merchant has a Google Pay QR code, you can pay at that merchant using a phone pay app. Or a, or a WhatsApp app. And this interoperability and unbundling of QR codes essentially created a new class of entrepreneurs who put thousands of feet on the street to blanket the country with QR codes. So India took 60 years to get to 6 million QR codes, and it is reaching 60 million, 10x, uh, 6 million POS machines. And in three years, it's getting to 60 million QR codes. So you can see the dramatic step function change that this technology has done and made payments ubiquitous at merchant locations. And then, of course, there is the DigiLocker platform, which is all built on top of this. DigiLocker is an example of an Indian government cloud where you can store all your documents securely. Today, 134 million Indians use the DigiLocker on their phones, and they use it to store their Aadhaar card this, or their driver's license, their vehicle uh, registration when they buy that XUV 700 or whatever. And also, they use it to store the vaccination certificates. So when you get a vaccination certificate, you can choose to keep it locally on your phone. You can choose to so store it in your DigiLocker and you can use it to, uh, or you can print it out and show it to somebody. And not many countries have this infrastructure. So fundamentally today, the only thing you need in your pocket is your phone. Because you can use your phone to make payments with UPI, and you can use DigiLocker to store your documents when the cop drives you for driving late at night. You can just show your driver's license on your phone. When you go to the airport, you can show your ID on the phone. So everything is on the phone. And this is happening at a scale of you know, million, 100 million, 200 million people. So this DigiLocker makes transactions paperless. And then, of course, as somebody who's in the moving business, the automotive business, we have seen how Fastag and GST has cut waiting times at interoperability at, at borders. 
There's enough data now to show that uh, there is a dramatic reduction in the time that vehicles take uh, when they pay with Fastag as compared to the old model of fishing around in their pocket for some loose change. Fastag, again, a system which I designed in 2010, is now used across the country and does millions of transactions. And that, along with GST, has made a big difference. So you can see the volumes here. Last year, Fastag did 2.4 billion transactions. And now, as you all know, in the Rajesh will know that every car has to go out with a Fastag. So Fastag is there on every car and every truck which is manufactured. So it's become ubiquitous as a paperless way of making payments. And the other benefit of Fastag has been it has essentially cleaned up the revenue generation of highways. Because you no longer, in the old model, when you took cash, you didn't know how much of the cash actually reached the, 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 the you know, how much cash was being siphoned off. But now all payments are digital, and therefore road projects have become more finance worthy. Because now you can, you can predict the cash flow, of, because there's going to be real money coming from digital transactions. And that in turn allows the government to monetize their assets, sell their roads, uh, existing roads to you know, pension, pension funds or whoever, and then recycle that capital in building new roads. So there's a huge, I'm trying to point, the whole link is there. You put in technology, improve efficiency, make uh, projects roadworthy, monetize that, create liquidity, put the capital back. So all this is happening there. And it has also made our government spending more efficient. India, cumulatively, in the last 10 years, has transferred $310 billion into people's bank accounts. And particularly during the pandemic, hundreds of, hundreds of millions of people got money uh, as emergency money because of the, their lost jobs that had gone back to the villages. And there have been a total of about a billion transactions since we started, India started this project. The other big thing is what's happening in taxation. Essentially, India is probably among the few places where both indirect tax and direct tax is digital first. So in GST, every 13.7 million companies are registered, they, they pay electronically, they can go to any bank and make the payment now under TIN 2.0, so you can pay anywhere. Uh, I'm sorry, that's on the income tax side. On the GST side, you can go to any bank. Uh, you, you file your returns digitally, GST 1, 2, 3, all that stuff. You file your invoices digitally because you need invoices to be filed for getting tax credits, all digital. And 13.7 million businesses today are doing that. Similarly, our entire in income tax system is digital. 71.4 million taxpayers are filing income tax returns and paying digitally. And what is, what is happening because of this is that India's tax-to-GDP ratio is going up and will go up even further. So today, if we have GDP growth of 6-7%, inflation of 7%, nominal GDP growth of 14-15%, our tax collection is going up at 30-40%. to 40%. In other words, tax collection is two times GDP growth. And even if it drops to 1.5 times GDP growth, What's going to happen in the next 10 years is India's tax-to-GDP ratio will keep going up. It's already at 11.7%, which is the highest in 20 years. And you will, government will therefore have more money to spend on public projects, infrastructure, you know, reduce deficits and all that good stuff. So you're seeing a very secular trend where India's tax-to-GDP ratio is going to go up in the next decade. And then the capital markets have been transformed. Today, anybody can apply for an IPO on their phone using the UPI ASBA feature. In the LIC IPO, more than 50% of the applications came through UPI. And that's, this is also a reason for building the SIP market, the systemic investment plan. And so millions and millions of people are using this. It's growing every day. And fundamentally, because of the SIP, which brings in billions of dollars every, every year, India has been protected from the rapid, you know, the, the thing with these FIIs is as soon as some interest rate goes up, they all vanish. They all take the money and run away. And India historically has been vulnerable to capital flight. But that is no longer true because our domestic, share, domestic investors have held the, held the thing going. And the domestic investors have held it going because they use SIPs. 
and that's a big part. And SIP is possible because of NACH, which has a recurring mandate, and now increasingly UPI, which has a, or a, has a mandate called auto pay, which allows you to set up. So you know, the, what I'm trying to say, all this stuff is all, all connected, and fundamentally our, our markets are in much better shape. And all this is formalizing the economy. People who are outside the system are coming into the system. Companies that are outside the system are coming into the system. And everybody is getting used to digital technology. So this is the only country in the world where anybody has built population scale digital public infrastructure. This is a chart from PhonePay, which lights up the consumption of digital payments across the country. And as you can see, it's all over the place. Maybe it's less in some parts of the country. But fundamentally, it is not just an urban phenomenon or a rich people's phenomenon. It's a universal national phenomenon. And this is based on the philosophy of creating public goods, which are interoperable and competitive and open and accessible. Anybody can compete and so on. It's not about creating a wall garden winner take all kind of thing. And then of course, this has been made possible by India's IT services industry. My friend Gurnani is somewhere here. Gurnani is here. So Tech Mahindra, Infosys, Wipro, TCS. India's IT industry took 30 years to reach 100 billion. It took 10 years to go from 100 billion to 200 billion. It's going to go to from 200 billion to 300 billion in three years. So there's a step change acceleration of this industry as India becomes the de facto center of global technology development. The number of people employed in the industry is about 5 million. It's going to double to 10 million. All of them are going to buy those vehicles you make. And it's going to create a massive economic demand because every one job in the IT industry creates uh, you know, four or five jobs in other sectors. And along with that, so this is also a massive foreign exchange benefit for the country, along with which is our inward remittance also by our human capital. And as you saw today's paper, so far last year, India's foreign, uh, inward remittance was $86 billion. This year is going to be $100 billion. And fundamental shifts are happening. In the old days, it was people from Kerala going to the Gulf. In the new world, it's people from UP going to Finland. So the whole game has changed. So over the next 10 years, there's going to be a dramatic increase in inward remittance from around the world by Indians who are going to work. And the combination of inward remittances and IT is fundamentally allowing you to create a $500 billion balance sheet on the foreign exchange front. And then, of course, there's a whole startup ecosystem. India had 1,000 startups in 2016. Last year, it had 90,000 startups, 90x in seven years. It's crazy. And massive funding happening. And you're going to see a lot of activity here. And of course, many of them may not succeed. But even if 10% succeed, they will change the country. So there's a massive startup ecosystem. And they're leveraging the talent that is there in the IT group. They're leveraging the foreign exchange. They're leveraging the digital infrastructure which we have. And now we are a young, connected country that consumes uh, content digitally. A great example is uh, IPL rights. You know, when IPL started, there were only television rights. There were no digital rights. And then slowly, digital rights started. In the last IPL auction, digital rights got more money than television rights. And that shows how India shifted in 10 years as a digitally consuming company. And that's very obvious. In 2016, not very far back, guys used to huddle in some TV shop and watch cricket. Now they don't need to do that because they can get it on their own device. There's a shift in four years. There's a kind of technology change that's happening. And startups have captured the imagination of young people. 2012, IIT topper said, I want to be a scientist. Now he says, I want to be Elon Musk. So that's a big change in the mindset of people. And also, there's a startup alumni ecosystem. There are 113 startups founded by Mintra alumni. There are 318 startups founded by Flipkart alumni, just two companies. You can imagine that as this takes off, more companies will beget more companies, like nuclear fission. And ultimately, there are going to be many, many more entrepreneurs in the society. 
And of course, that is having an impact on incumbents. You know, you guys make electric scooters for Ether, uh, for Hero Electric, because they have to compete with Ether. Tata launches new because they want to compete with Nika. Jupiter and Open are so-called new banks, so SBI and, and Kotak. So you know, and you know, you guys are launching electric vehicles, three wheelers. So fundamentally, this startup energy is also making incumbents say that we need to be, do better than them. And therefore, you're creating a, you're, we have never seen this level of innovative energy in the system that we have now. So this will continue to transform India in the, what are the new areas where we will see it? I talked about what happened. What will happen? The big three, and all three have implications for you, is credit, e-commerce, and logistics. All these three are going to get disrupted over the next decade. First of all, I think we are going to enter into a credit super cycle. Indians have always had a huge unmet demand for credit, but now supply is increasing because of the financialization of savings. So less people are keeping their money in real estate and gold, more people are keeping their money in financial services. You can see that with the rise of family offices and all that good stuff. Now, combination of digital public goods and startups is solving the three big challenges of credit. Whom to give it to, how to make sure it's reliable and it's, uh, you know, because after all, the main thing in credit is to get your money back. So how do you make sure you give it to guys who give their money back? And thirdly, how do you intercept the cash flow so that you can get money in his flow so that he can't, you know, he can't not pay you? These are fundamental issues. Now, all three are going to change. And I believe that just like UPI transformed payments, credit is going to get transformed in the coming 10 years. The volume will go up, the velocity will go up, the veracity, that is, accuracy will go up, and the variety of credit will go up. Retail, consumer, this, that, everything will happen. And I always think that with small tickets, uh, loans are exploding. And essentially, information collateral, which is your digital footprint, will replace asset collateral. So in the old days, when you gave a loan, said, give me your balance sheet, what assets do you have? In the new world, you look at your digital flow, how many invoices you paid, how much business you got, all uh, digitally. All that will give you the data to decide whether you're a good credit risk or not. So information collateral is replacing credit collateral. And then, of course, the whole logistics is being done. So there's massive private sector interest in reforming the logistics chain. You're looking at last mile three-wheeler electric for delivery. All that is going to be massive. That is accompanied by huge investment on the public side. So suddenly, there's both public investment and private investment. Just to look at Bangalore Airport. Bangalore Airport handles 35 million passengers a year. The new terminal, Terminal 2, which got launched recently, will add 20 million. That's 55 million. And in the next seven years, they're going to add one more terminal, they'll go to 80 billion. 80 million a year. 80 million a year is Heathrow. Can you imagine? Bangalore will be as big as Heathrow in seven years. So this is what is happening. The kind of change which is happening is staggering. So the combination of private investment, innovation, and public investment is going to transform logistics. And Again, logistics will go from offline, informal to online and formal, and all data-driven. So everything, you'll be able to track everything. And the enough people I see who are doing that, and that, by the way, is a picture generated by an AI called DAL-E to show what's happening out there. It's an Indian truck driver looking at his phone. And then, of course, so DPGs, GST, e-way bill, fast tag, all are creating a single physical market, along with the innovations that you're all driving. And then the third big thing is going to be the e-commerce expansion. And here again, just like I talked about digital public goods and opening it up, we are essentially the thing called ONDC, which is going to open up e-commerce and allow everyone to participate. And fundamentally, e-commerce is going to be far more inclusive, and it will bring millions of small retailers into commerce. So what e ONDC is doing is converting all commerce into e-commerce. or so. Payments are already digitized. Inventory will get digitized. So any supplier can declare his catalog on ONDC, and anybody can order it on that from his catalog. Discovery gets digitized because I can order from any app. I can use a phone pay app. I can use your app and order something. And logistics will be a service. So I'll get 
one of your companies to have it delivered to me. So the unbundling of e-commerce, which is again a unique Indian phenomenon, will completely turn things upside down in the world of commerce. And then today in the world of commerce, there are very strong linkages between wholesalers, retailers, distributors, because they give credit. So as a wholesaler is as much a lender as a supplier of things, and therefore the bonds are very tight. But once we unbundle credit, and everybody in the value chain can get access to affordable credit from formal systems, then it no longer depends on credit to, from the wholesaler. And so the whole supply chain is going to get untangled in the years to come. So what we saw in the digital world was Google plus Facebook, ads, Stripe, Amazon Web Services, all enabled you to start a digital company. Because you all just had to use a credit card and you were good to go. India will see credit plus ONDC plus UPI plus logistics providing a full stack for selling physical products. Because what I can sell can be put on my ONDC. If anybody can order it and some logistics guy can deliver it and I can pay it, what's left? So fundamentally, the way we think about products, about brands, all that is going to change in the coming years. So what I try to explain to you is that we have exponential change which happens, but it happens gradually and then suddenly something happens. And we saw that with identity, IT services, smartphones, etc. But this is all a domino effect. Each one is affecting the next. And all this stuff is now interacting and leading to that $10 trillion, $10 trillion economy that we have. So fundamentally, India is actually creating a new model of growth, which is technology-led, which is collaborative, which is equitable and democratization. And you're going to see some amazing stuff in the coming 10 years, and you guys are going to make it happen. Thank you very much.